Okay, usually I like to give a nice title uh, to describe the problem, but I didn't here because I couldn't really figure out a way to describe this. So I said the Lagrangian mechanics, and we're just going to go from there. Here's, uh, let me describe it to you though. I don't want to leave you hanging. So there's like a flat table with a hole in the middle, and then there's a mass M1 connected to us with us by a string to mass 2, which is hanging through the circle, a, a hole in the table, and it's frictionless. So, you know, this, these two masses can move around uh, in different ways, and we want to find the motion, okay? So the first thing is, uh, when we think about Lagrangian, uh, and remember Lagrangian, I should have wrote this down, T minus U, and the solution is uh, the case where the Lagrangian is a stationary state integrated over time. So that means we can use the Euler-Lagrange equation, the partial of L with respect to, let's just call it, uh, Q minus the derivative of L with respect to Q dot dt is equal to zero. And we can have more than one variables. So in this case, how many variables do we have? How many, how many coordinates do we need to describe the system? Well, I mean, obviously this mass can move up and down, so that's maybe one. Uh, this mass can move uh, increase in the distance from the hole, but that's related to that one, right? Uh, and then this can move around in a circle. So it looks like three, maybe two. Uh, it's not quite clear. It is clear. Okay, we know it's clear. So let's just start writing down some equations. Uh, if we over uh, use the coordinates, it's fine. Um, we'll just make an equation of constraints. So I'm going to say right here, I have this angle theta. I'm going to use this vector, this position r, the distance from the center to there, and then I'll call this s. So that's the distance below. Um, so of course I can say uh, r plus s is equal to a constant, right? The, the distance from here plus the distance down there has to be the same as a constant because the string's not going to stretch. And then here I have m1 and m2. So let's write down the kinetic energy. I'm going to say kinetic energy is going to be one half m1 x1 dot squared plus y1 dot squared plus one half m2 z2 dot squared. So I wrote this in terms of Cartesian coordinates because I know the kinetic energy in Cartesian coordinates. So this one, of course, z is just s, so I could replace that uh, as with s dot. But what about up here? What what's the the? How do I do that? Well, let's go ahead and um, if I call this the x y plane, then I could say x is r. This is x one. X one is r cosine theta. Y one equals r sine theta. So then x one dot is going to be the derivative of this. So I can say this is going to be r dot times cosine theta plus, now I've taken the derivative of this, so it's going to be actually minus theta dot r sine theta, right? Because I do have to take the derivative of cosine theta is negative sine theta, then I have to take the derivative of theta, and I get theta dot, so I get that. Now if we do the same thing for y dot, y1 dot is going to be r dot sine theta plus r theta dot cosine theta. And yeah, I've skipped a step there because I've done this so many times. Okay, so now we can find the kinetic energy by squaring these two. So I'm going to do this the long way, uh, even though I've done it before. x1 dot squared is going to be r dot squared cosine squared theta minus, now I'm going to get this times this plus this times this, so I'm going to get two of those, minus 2 r r dot theta dot cosine theta sine theta and then I'm going to get this term, so plus theta dot squared, r squared, sine squared theta. And then y1 dot squared is going to be equal to r dot squared, sine squared theta. And then I can get two terms over here, plus 2 r, r dot theta dot, cosine theta, sine theta, plus theta dot squared, r squared, cosine squared theta. Now when I add these two together, then I'm going to get some things that I can fix, right? Because here I have an r dot squared cosine squared theta plus r dot squared sine squared theta. I can factor out the r dot squared and I get cosine squared 
plus sine squared, which is 1. So I get x1 dot squared plus y1 dot squared. It's going to be r dot squared. Now this term I have negative and a positive, but that, so those two cancel. And over here I can factor out a theta dot squared r squared, and then I get sine squared plus cosine squared, which is 1. So I get r squared, that's not a dot, theta dot squared. So that's that's easy. Okay, let's write down the kinetic energy and the potential energy now in terms of these these variables. Okay, so it's a little bit easier. Oh, so about the potential, let's call this uh, z equals zero. So this is going to be uh, negative. The potential here, I'll write it over here. U is going to be negative m two g s, right? Because s is the distance below that. So I can say T equals one half M1, and then I get R dot squared plus R squared theta dot squared plus one half M2 S dot squared minus, and this is, let's just put this as L, um, minus the potential, which is negative, so I get plus M2 G S. Okay, so here are three variables, right? I have r and r dot, theta dot, s dot. So that's three different variables. I don't want to deal with three variables, I only want two. So let's say r plus s equals c. So s equals c minus r. So up here, I can replace s with c minus r, and I can find the derivative s dot is going to be the derivative of that constant c, which is 0, minus r dot. So now I get l equals 1 half m1 r dot squared plus r squared theta dot squared plus 1 half m2 r dot squared. Okay, so here, remember that squared, so I get negative r dot squared is this r dot squared. And then I'm going to get plus m2 g c minus r. And let's just combine these terms up because I have two r dots. So I get uh, equals 1 half m1 plus m2 r dot squared plus 1 half m1 r squared theta dot squared plus m2 g c minus r. So now I have two variables, right? I have theta and r. So now I can do the euler lagrange equation twice. Let's do theta first. So I'm going to start off with the partial of L with respect to theta. And you see, where's theta? Nope, 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 nope. There's none, zero. So now I can do the partial of L with respect to theta dot. And here I get nope. Here I get one. So the partial of this with respect to theta dot is theta dot squared. So I bring the two down. I get m1 r squared theta dot. And there's no other thetas. And the derivative of this with respect to <clears throat> t is equal to zero. That means this is a constant with respect to t. So I'm going to say m1 r squared theta dot equals some constant. Um, let's call this constant. Um, I feel like I should see. M. I think this is the angular momentum, and I'll, I'll use I'll use this lowercase l for angular momentum. I can't use capital L, right? Or use that. We have conservation of letters in physics. You know, once they get used, you can't reuse them. Um, <clears throat> okay. So now I need to do the same thing for uh, r. So say the partial of l with respect to r is equal to, right here I have one, I'm, I'm sorry, down here, right here I have one, so I have m1 r theta dot squared. And then right here I have one, so I have plus minus m2 g. Wait, so it's going to be minus, it's going to be plus but a minus, so it's minus, All right? So the partial of this, I have m2gc, the partial of that is 0, and I have negative m2gr, and the partial of that is just m2g. Now I can take the partial of L with respect to r dot, 
and I get up here I have an r dot term so I get uh, the 2 comes down and I have 2 over 2 is 1 so I have m1 plus m2 r dot and then I don't have any others okay so now I can take the derivative of this with respect to time the derivative with respect to time of the partial of L with respect to R dot is going to be uh, just M1 plus M2 R double dot. And this has to be equal to this, right? Because this minus this is zero. So I'm going to say that's equal to M1 R theta dot squared minus M2G. So there's my two equations. Let's put them together. Okay, let me rewrite them. Gotta have a straight sheet. So I had m1 r squared theta dot equals L, that's a constant, and then I had m1 plus m2 r double dot equals m1 r theta dot squared minus m2 g. Let me solve for r double dot. r double dot, I'm gonna divide by m1 plus m2, I get m1 over m1 plus m2 r theta dot squared minus m2 over m1 plus m2 g. Yeah. So I could solve this for theta dot, right? Over here I could say theta dot is going to be equal to L over m1 r squared. So I can square that theta dot squared right here is going to be equal to L squared over m1 squared r to the fourth. And that looks a little weird, but I could put that in right here because that's just a constant, right? Theta dot squared is a constant. So uh, I, I guess I'll put that in there. Mm, yeah, let's put this. So r double dot equals m1 over m1 plus m2 r, and then I have L squared over M1 squared r to the fourth minus M2 over M1 plus M2g. Let's think about this for a second. Let's think about the special cases, right? Here's my, here's my system. What if theta dot is zero. So I release it from rest just like this. Then this should be just a half Atwood machine. This this should just go that way and that should go that way and the acceleration I should know, right? So if theta dot is zero, which would be no angular momentum, then L is zero. So this whole this whole term is zero right here. So in if theta dot equals zero, which theta, theta is a constant, then I get R double dot equals negative m2 over m1 plus m2g. So the one that does have the right unit for acceleration. And also this says that uh, this is the half Atwood machine. I've done that problem before. I don't want to have to do it again right now, but that does work. Okay. And then you could take the limit as m2 gets really, really, really big. Then this would, ex if this m2 is really big, this should just have an acceleration of g, right? Because m1 doesn't matter and you do get that. <clears throat> also, if M1 is really big compared to M2, it would just sit there and wouldn't even accelerate or have very low acceleration, and that also agrees. And it's negative because it would be accelerating towards a smaller R. Okay, one other special case. What about this? Um, let's say, what if I get it in equilibrium so that it has some initial angular velocity and it moves in a circle? Well, in that case, I know the tension in the string would be m2g at, if it's at rest, right? If this is in equilibrium. So let's say um, this is circular motion. So t would be m2g, and that would be uh, the acceleration of this one, m1, times its acceleration in a circle. I'm doing this as magnitudes. Uh, would be with the acceleration of the centripetal acceleration is uh, omega squared r. So it'd be theta dot squared times r. Uh, so if I pick a value for r, then I could pick a value for theta that should, so if, if this is stable, then this should work. 
Okay, but now how do I check that? Let's say theta dot squared equals m2 g over m1 r. If I put that in up here, then what happens? Then I get r double dot equals m1 r theta dot squared is going to be this m2 g over m1 r and then I have m1 plus m2. So all I do is put in theta this theta dot in down here and then I have min and so you'll notice cancel 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 and then I have minus m2 g over m1 plus m2 and so that cancels with this so r double dot would be zero and that would be a circular orbit right because the acceleration that way so I'm pretty happy uh, so what can we do next well now we can look at all these other cases what if it's not a circular orbit but it's doing something weird like this you know let's do that and in order to do that I'm going to use Python I'm going to model this I'm going to make a visual module a visual representation of this it's going to be great and I'll do that in the next video but there you go